Right, just to give you some basic idea about what happens in the kiln, as I said, the raw feed comes in at the top end of the kiln and basically just goes by gravity to the other side, right? <clears throat> it is just going by gravity to the other side. So, there is a slow process by which the material basically comes in and goes out to the other end. Mind you, this entire kiln can be as long as 30 to 50 meters. Okay, most kilns are 30 to 40 meters, but especially if you have a wet process plant, the kiln can be as high as 80 to 100 meters also, because we need that extra bit of length for removing the water that is there in the process. But today, most kilns will be about 30 to 50 meters, about 4 to 6 meter diameter. That's, that's a very large piece of capital equipment that you are putting in a cement plant, right? So, the free water basically goes out first. Of course, in our case, as I said earlier, the preheater itself will remove all the free water. The decomposition or activation of the clay can happen at around 600 degrees Celsius and then you have decomposition of limestone that happens typically around 7 to 900 degrees Celsius. And then you start combining the silica and the alumina from the clay with the calcium oxide from the limestone. In various proportions, these combine and start forming compounds one of the initial compounds that forms is C2S and then you have the melt formation which is basically C3A plus C4AF. I will come to these compounds a little bit later and then in the final stage you have the formation of C3S inside the kiln. The clinker comes out and goes to the cooling process, right, which maintains a certain structure of the C3S and C2S. Without this cooling process being optimal, you will have a wrong combination that you end up getting after the cooling happens. Okay. So, as I said, it is very important to intergrind the cement with the gypsum in the end because gypsum has to be present as a set regulator. In the absence of gypsum, we get a flash set. The aluminates that are present in the system can immediately react with water, give off a lot of heat and that will lead to flash setting of the, con uh, of the cement. Now, during this process of ball milling or intergrinding, you need to have a strict control on temperature. Why? Because if you can imagine gypsum is basically calcium sulphate dihydrate. If you heat it, it transforms into calcium sulphate hemihydrate or which we all also call as plaster of Paris, right? Right? POP, basically half molecule of water is present. You further heat it, it becomes anhydrous calcium sulphate, you lose all the water. Now, later when we talk about the cement chemical admixture compatibility, you will see that the form in which you have these sulphates available in your system can go a long way in dictating what happens in the early stages when you add an admixture into the concrete. So, for that you need to ensure that when you have a strict control on temperature, you can control or regulate this transformation of the gypsum between anhydrite or hemihydrate. So, all this is happening while the material is getting ground in a ball mill or today as I said you have much more uh, sophisticated roller presses that do a better job uh, and produce more efficiently ground cement systems. Okay? So, the result of this process is you end up producing cement of the required fineness. So, typically we express fineness of the cement in surface area per unit mass or in meter square per kilogram. That means, if I take 1 kilogram of the cement and lay it out on a large sheet of paper and I am able to somehow compute the entire surface area of the cement, that is what the value will be. Mo for most cements, this is around 300 square meters per kilogram, mostly true for India, but if you travel to Europe or to the US, the cement finenesses are typically of the order of 350 or even more in square meters per kilogram. Now, as I said, you need to do a very strict quality control of the entire process. Otherwise, you are going to be producing cement that is highly variable and you can only imagine if you are producing cement and transporting it to the job site for a project that happens over the course of several years and if the cement is continuously going to be variable, then you have a problem. Concrete quality will not be maintained, the concrete characteristics will not be predictable and you will end up producing concrete which is really not up to the mark if your cement is not properly controlled. So, for that, there are several factors that are carefully chosen 
and ensure that you are maintaining your cement composition within those limits. One important factor is the lime saturation factor. The lime saturation factor basically looks at what is the content of the lime that is able to properly combine with the silica alumina and iron oxide to produce the cementitious compound. So here lime saturation factor is given as C divided by 2.8 S plus 1.2 A plus 0.65 F where C S A F okay again cement chemistry we are a little bit different in terms of the notations that we used as compared to the actual chemists. C here is not carbon, C is calcium oxide, S is silicon dioxide, A is Al2O3 and F is Fe2O3. So all these oxides are given these short notations so that we have some comfort while writing the equations. We do not want to be lost while writing these equations. Okay? So we want the lime saturation factor to be generally as close to 1 as possible. That means almost all of the calcium oxide is present in a bound form. That is what it means, right? Generally between 92 and 98 percent is generally preferable. If you have more than 100 percent, that means there is excess of lime available and that is what we call as free lime. And this free lime is not good for the cement because it leads to unsoundness. Unsoundness means at the time of setting, the cement <coughs> paste basically experiences an increase in its volume and that happens because of the transformation of free lime that is calcium oxide, free lime is calcium oxide to calcium hydroxide. When it reacts with water, it transforms to calcium hydroxide and there is a change in volume of the cement paste which is not considered to be a good thing. That is why we want to restrict the free lime to as low as possible. Okay? Now, the silica ratio is another factor that is controlled or silica modulus sometimes it is called is the silica to the sum of the alumina and the iron oxide that is present in the system. It is generally maintained between 2 and 3. The alumina ratio or modulus A by F is generally about 1 to 4. Of course, this is a very large value that I am giving you here, but then more or less it is closer to about 1 to 2 is what would be the correct level of alumina modulus that is present. The other factor that needs to be controlled is the potential C3S from Bogue formulation. Now, Bogue was another cement scientist who did a lot of basic understanding of cement chemistry and he proposed that based on the way that cement forms in the kiln or based on the way that the oxides combine in the kiln from a starting mixture of calcium oxide, silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide, iron oxide, you can then predict the potential quantities of the compounds that are actually ending up forming compounds like C3S, C2S, C3A and C4AF. So lime saturation factor as I said again is very important. We do not want excess free lime in your system that leads to unsoundness of the, of, of the cement paste. So in terms of oxide composition, you have calcium oxide which is written as C, silicon dioxide S, aluminum oxide A, Fe2O3 that is F and you may also have other minor oxides that are present but which have a large role to play in how the cement actually performs. Magnesium oxide could be from the magnesium bearing impurities present in the limestone. You have sulfur trioxide, SO3 which is coming from the gypsum obviously and a some amount of alkali sulfates could also be present. Your aluminum, so alkali oxides as well as the sul sulfur trioxide could be from alkali sulfates also. The alkali sulfates are impurities that are present along with the clinker sometimes. There are other minor oxides which are not really having a very large bearing on the way that cement reacts with water. So as I said, from the oxide composition, you can apply the approximate equations which we know as Bogue equations to convert the oxide compositions into compound compositions. So percentage C3S is given like this. Percentage C2S is calculated after you determine C3S. Percentage C4AF is based on assumption that all the iron combines to form C4AF and then you can calculate percentage C3A. So all of these compounds can be approximately calculated, but this is not the way to actually get the true mixture of the compounds that are present in cement. You have much more sophisticated methods than this to get a quantitative estimate of the amount of uh, these compounds present in the cement. Usually we do it by a quantitative x-ray diffraction analysis, but that is not 
a focus of this course, so I am not going to get there in detail. But for approximate understanding of the compound composition, you can apply the Bogue equations. So, once the cement actually forms and if you take a look under the microscope, you will see a mixture of different types of grains that are present in the system, right. You will get the primary grains of calcium silicates or which are C3S and C2S and you will then get a fairly uh, inconsistent or uh, unrecognizable uh, with a high degree of clarity unrecognizable mass of products that are basically your aluminates that are forming in your system. Okay? So, you have large irregular crystals of C3S which we otherwise call as A light. Okay? A light we are mentioning impure form of C3S, not very pure C3S, C3S as a compound. Okay, again very interesting to see why do we write C3S? Basically C3S is 3CaO SiO2 and C2S is basically 2CaO SiO2. That means three parts of calcium oxide is combining with one, one part of silica. We do not really know this product as a mineral on its own naturally occurring mineral because most naturally occurring minerals you will name it with a ITE at the end. right? That is why cement scientists chose to name C3S as A light. C3S is not pure as I said it has alkali sulphates, it may have other oxides that are present as impurities and because of that it is known as A light. Similarly, C2S is transformed into the name B light just to make it look like a mineral. right? Most minerals have that kind of a nomenclature that mostly the names end with ITE. And then you have the ground mass which I said was not very consistent, you are not able to recognize each of these phases individually. The ground mass consists of the flux phases which is basically your aluminates that is your C3A and C4AF are present at the ground mass. So, I will show you a couple of pictures. So, here it is an example of clinker that you can see. Here these are the irregular crystals that you see of C3S. Here more rounded crystals of C2S. Okay. Again you can see another rounded crystal of C2S and you see this uh, ground mass that is present here. That is basically a mixture of C3A plus C4AF. In this picture, all of these are basically C3S. That is also C3S. Okay. All of these, comp uh, these uh, irregular crystals are C3S. So, you have a cluster of C3S particles together, but you have a large amount of this ground mass C3A plus C4 AF. Now, obviously, the crystal size and the presence of the impurities in the system will have a large bearing on the reactivity of these phases. Now, be <coughs> because C3S has such an irregular structure, it lends itself to being highly reactive. Whereas, C2S which is more rounded is not so reactive. Okay? And further your C3A basically is another very reactive material. C4AF could be reactive, but the problem is that for reaction to happen, your material should first dissolve in the water and then react. Because iron is present, the extent of dissolution is very limited. So, C4AF almost does not even react much at all in the cementitious system. Okay? So, reactivity basically is very high for C3S and for C3A. So, most modern cement where we want early age performance relies a lot on the reactivity that we get from C3S and C3A. We really do not get too much from the other components that is C2S and C4AF. Again, another example of a clinker which is seen under the optical microscope which is showing you C3S particles and a cluster of C2S. Here again you see a large cluster of C2S with some C3S in the system here. Okay? So, what happens is all of these cements end up being the same ordinary potent cement. In India, we have graded cement, right? 53, 43 and so on. So, they are all ultimately going to be ordinary potent cement. But their internal structure could differ significantly. And all of these characteristics of the way that the clinker has formed inside the kiln can have a bearing on the actual reactivity and performance of these cements. Okay? So, again, 
it's fairly complex to truly predict a cement performance just based on its structure or its or its composition you need both angles to be looked at carefully 